I did not wear my standard Christmas stole today. Rather, the one that I love so much of all the little children in the world. And I think you can understand the significance of that. Last week, we heard the words of Isaiah as he said, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. You see, that's a reminder that during Advent, we are making way for the Lord. We are preparing for Him. We're supposed to be getting ready for Christmas. And it's not easy, particularly now, for many of us. I didn't want to, and I still don't want to preach today. If this was last Friday, I could not have made it. And I told some people, I can't make it to preach in the pulpit on Sunday. You see, Friday, something terrible happened in the life of this country. And I experienced a breakdown like I have never had in my life. I cried and cried. I cried probably more in that few hours of Friday afternoon than I have in my entire life together. When I got the news that those 20, or at one time they said 30, little children had been shot, I couldn't help it. I broke down and I cried. You see, I saw little children spread across their desks in their classroom and trying to get out, some already dead some dying and some crying mommy and daddy help me and there was no help and i cried and there was christmas music and people even saying merry christmas i saw mommies and daddies who would never hold their little child again and grandparents kneeling down and praying, begging God that it wasn't their child, that their child would be safe. And I cried. And the music continued. And there were still people saying, Merry Christmas. I saw the face of Mishka among those little children and I cried, and the music was not as loud, and fewer people were saying Merry Christmas. I saw Ian and Aiden, and I knew their grandma and grandpa would not be able to bring them to church again, and I cried. And the music was more distant. And the Christmas tidings began to fade. I saw a little Brendan and Karen and Nedra and knew they would never laugh and romp together again. And I cried. And not hearing any more music, the music was fading out. And not very many people were saying Merry Christmas. And I saw Victoria, and I realized 
that she would not even get to see her daddy on weekends again. And I cried. There was no more music and only a whisper of a Merry Christmas. I saw Sandy and Larry's little baby, grandbaby, Reese, and I realized that was one grandchild they would not get to see play ball at school. And I cried, and the music stopped, and no one was saying Merry Christmas. I cried and I said, I don't even want to hear about Christmas this year. And not only was there no more music, there was no one smiling, no one hoping for a Merry Christmas. You see, getting ready for Christmas with all the sadness, particularly this year, is hard to do. It is never easy preparing for Christmas, particularly in a world such as ours. It never has been, and my friends, that's the point. It never has been easy preparing for Christmas in a world like ours. Christ came because this world like ours needed saving. It needed saving then and it needs saving now. There was a popular song that I used to like back in the 1950s and it carries such a great truth for you and I and the whole world today. The song was, if I ever needed you, I need you now. You know, I can still hear Don Cornell singing that song. And I remember the words that I recite. If I, and I would change that, oh God, if we ever needed you, we need you now. It's no wonder our time is in such a turmoil. Look at some of the toys and games on TV that we have for children. There's a game that was called Forward Command Post. Well, it's essentially a bombed out dollhouse, complete with smashed furniture, broken railings, and bullet holes in all of the walls. It's a game that's recommended for children five years and up. One of the big game sellers has been Grand Theft Auto 3. A summary of the game was written by the New York Times. This is their summary. It's kind of X-rated, so I'll alert you to that. This is a game in which all boundaries of civilized behavior have vanished. You get to shoot whoever you want, including cops. You get to beat women to death with baseball bats. You get to have sex with prostitutes and then kill them to get your money back. What a wonderful teaching game to be on the market for our young people, don't you think? No wonder people think today that it's just quite okay to take their automatic weapons and their blocks into malls and churches and schools. It's not easy to prepare for Christmas in a world such as ours, a world at war, a world where we foster hatred in all of our various religions, in our politics, and where we glorify hate and anger and war in our games. 
And where does that lead us, my friends? It leads us to Newtown, Connecticut, the site of another in a long list of slaughters by crazies with guns. In case you had any doubt, or do in the coming weeks, I want to point out one fact, undisputable fact, my friends. Not one, not one of those children in Newtown would be dead today if there had not been a gun in the classroom. We can talk all we want about the mental capacities of the shooter. We can talk about all of those things, but you cannot deny that there are 20 children dead because there was a gun in the classroom. The fact is, regardless of what the mental capacities of the shooters are, there is no way, no way, they could wreck the havoc that they wreck if they did not possess those weapons of life destruction. The results this week and earlier in Portland and the many previous incidents in Colorado, Arkansas, Texas, Kentucky, and Virginia Tech University, and throughout the country is what our gun-loving country and society is creating. Yes, I saw things Friday afternoon, and I cried, and I'm still crying, and yet I had to get ready to preach on Sunday and to prepare for Christmas. I began to lose sight, along with a lot of other people, about the meaning of the season, the season of hope, the season of peace, the season of love and the season of joy, the season of the coming of the Christ child. It is not easy to prepare for Christmas in such a world as ours. I would like to see the world in a very positive way. I would like to have the hope that was expressed by President Bush and his wife Laura after that terrible attack of 9-11. They chose as their Christmas message on the annual presidential Christmas card a message from the book of Psalms. The message was, I believe I shall see the goodness of the Lord in this land of the living. Think of that. Think of it. Is it really possible, really possible, that we will see the goodness of the Lord in this land of our living? That's the promise of Christmas. The promise that all mankind will see God's salvation. That is the hope that sustains us in good times and in bad times. We shall see God's salvation. Christ came because the world needed saving. It needed saving then, and it surely needs saving now. Christmas is a time when somehow or another we can get beyond, hopefully, the violence, the hatred, and even disbelief. We can experience cheer, and we can experience goodwill, even though it is very difficult to prepare for. There is something about that Christmas spirit that can indeed permeate our thinking. It can bring us to hope, to peace, and to love in spite of ourselves. Hope 
and love can break down all the barriers that we have. During World War II, a troop ship was carrying 500 German prisoners and 25 civilian women and children to New Zealand. And as the ship was entering the coastal waters of New Zealand, it was Christmas Eve, and they had been traveling for two months, and all were homesick, they were anxious, and there were some who were even frightened. And someone came up with the idea of asking the ship's captain if it would be all right if they sang Christmas carols to the German prisoners because they figured they were surely as homesick and frightened as the other passengers on board. And the permission was granted. A small choral group made its way to the quarters where the German soldiers were being held. And the uh, choral group decided to sing Silent Night as it was written in Germany by Joseph Moore, and it would have been equally well known by the prisoners. Within seconds of the beginning of the carol, a deafening clatter shook the floor. Hundreds of German soldiers sprang up out of their bunks and they ran to the windows to be able to see what was going on and to watch the carolers as they sang. Tears streamed unashamedly down the cheeks of those German soldiers. And at that moment, at that very moment, people on both sides of the wall experienced a universal truth that all people everywhere are one. Hope and love broke down the barriers between warring nations and for that moment at least they were all one family. We are meant to be one and in that knowledge says Steve Gooder we find true peace. There is something about Christmas that can indeed elevate our spirit. Who can deny that the love of Christmas has the power to transform human society? In fact, that's exactly what Christmas was designed to do. Transform human society. It does that by the power of hope. Hope that came through the baby Jesus Christ. You know, whenever a baby is born in a family, a baby that is eagerly awaited for months, it still comes with great promise. And we can stare in to the eyes of that young baby. And we see the coming of the days when the baby says, Mama or Dada. And in Rodas, in my case, Gamma and Gampa. Even as we cuddle that baby, that dear little baby, we do so knowing that even before we know it, that child will be so soon be a grown adult. And I still see those six and seven year old children who will never, never become adults. And who just a short few years ago, their mamas and their grandpas had that feeling of looking in their eyes and having the joy of a baby in the house is the joy of the anticipation of a lifetime of love, of laughter, of heartache, 
and of growth and for how many it has been destroyed. So, with Christ came the promise of God, the promise of a still to be realized time of peace on earth and goodwill to men. It hasn't yet come, but it will. And every time we lift our voices in the great carols of Christmas, and every time that we recite the ancient prophecies of the coming of the Messiah, we are affirming that even though this world still stands in the need of saving, the Savior has come, and because he has come, there is hope. The message of Christmas must always be one of hope. This world needs saving, yes, but God began that process over 2,000 years ago with the birth of a baby in Bethlehem. There is something about Christmas that can elevate us. Christmas is about the hope of a better world to come. May your better world begin with this Advent before Christmas. And let us, over the next few weeks, think together about what we can do to help this become a better world. How can we do that as individuals? How can we do that as a church? And whatever it is that you think we can do, I want you to know that each of us, you and I, have our part to do. I'm sure God is counting on that. May God bless and comfort all of those who suffered so much from that terrible act in Newtown, Connecticut. May this be that one time as a nation that we do not just simply mourn for a few days or for some short period of time and then dismiss it from our memory and let it fade into the past. May we as individuals, a church, and a nation take steps to assure that this kind of carnage stops. Amen.